Welcome everybody. I've got some very good news tonight. We discovered that this was a brand new whiteboard and it still had the plastic coating on it. <laughs> so we're not going to have any problems tonight. <laughs> I can use and rub and use and rub. Isn't that good news? <laughs> tonight our lecture is on the acid alkaline balance. And if you've ever had a swimming pool, you test the acid alkaline every morning because if the water goes to acid, the pipes corrode. If the water goes to, al to alkaline, algae grows on the pipes. Just as acid alkaline is important in the swimming pool, in the garden, it is also very important in the body. So we'll begin by looking at the acid alkaline scale. And as we go through this, we will see its importance. So at one end, we've got acid. This is the pH scale, and pH means potential hydrogen. When you dissolve acid in a solution, it gives off hydrogen ions. So pH means potential hydrogen. That's what you're testing when you test for acid alkaline. Up the other end, we've got alkaline, and its reading is 14. And in the middle, we've got neutral. So neutral is neither acid nor alkaline. Blood has a reading on the pH scale, and blood's reading is between 7.35 and 7.4. If blood pH goes up to 8, the person will go into a coma and die of alkalosis. And if blood pH drops down to 7.22, the person will go into a coma and die of acidosis. So there cannot be much variation there, can there? And we don't have to worry about the pH of our blood because there are two organs that are constantly uh, monitoring and balancing the pH of the blood. One is the lungs. And this explains why, when you did your high intensity this morning, which I'm sure you all did, as you started to go running up those hills or on your exercise bike or on your push-ups, notice your breathing changed. Your breathing starts to go very, very deep. And the reason for that is that all the little muscle cells are burning more oxygen. They're giving off more uh, carbon dioxide, lactic acid, creating a more acid condition in the blood. And so the brain says to the lungs, breathe deep because oxygen alkalizes. And when you're breathing out, you're breathing out some of the carbon dioxide, which creates an acid environment. So it's in that way that your breathing helps to, to control the acid alkaline balance. The other organ that has a part to play in monitoring this is the kidneys. Now the kidneys do it in a fascinating way. So let me, draw, let me show you how this happens. This is the smallest unit in the kidney, the most important, it's a nephron. And this is the little Bowman's capsule, which is the little filtering unit. Now, there are one million in one kidney. So we have approximately two million of these. And in those little filtering units, the blood is filtered. And then the blood weaves around these tubules. And then it comes out into the bladder where it's urinated out. So the, the blood comes in, it weaves around the filtering units, and then it comes out and weaves around the tubules. In your kidneys, which is basically like this, those little filtering units are all on the edge, like this, called the cortex. And these tubules basically weave 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 like that, into the ureter, into the bladder, and then there's the ureter from the other kidney. So that's what it looks like. In a 24-hour period day, those little filtering units filter 1,800 litres of blood. Now, we don't have that much blood, but every two minutes, 1.2 litres is being filtered. So it's continually going through. 
Out of that 180 litres of blood, uh, sorry, 1,800 litres of blood, 180 litres of filtrate is filtered out. But we only urinate 1.5 litres. Aren't you glad we don't urinate 180 litres a day, otherwise you'd be leaving this lecture every five minutes. God is good, what an amazing body we live in. Well, where's the other approximately 160 litres? Well, there's a reabsorption in the tubule area. So with this little Bowman's capsule, this little filtering unit in the kidney, and there they all are on the edge, the blood comes in, it's filtered, the filtrate goes around the tubules to be urinated out, but notice how the blood weaves around the tubules. And it is in this reabsorption area where your pH is being monitored. Now let's say the pH of the blood is getting too acid. Well, it is here that extra acid is dropped into the tubules to be urinated out. But let's say the pH of the blood is getting too alkaline. It is here that extra acid is pulled out of the tubules and back into the blood. So every two minutes, 1.2 litres is being filtered. So there's this constant monitoring to keep the blood pH within that range, and you can see why, <laughs> otherwise we die. Did you know your body's ever trying to keep you alive? In this reabsorption area, a couple of other things happen too. Uh, blood pressure is also monitored balanced. Sodium and water levels in the body are also monitored and balanced in this area. You'll never look at your kidneys the same again, will you? No wonder it's important to be mindful of the kidneys. I love the proverb, Proverbs 14, verse 6, knowledge is easy to him that understands. When you understand how this is all balanced, then you begin to, then you have the knowledge on how to treat the kidney. And what does the kidney love? The kidney loves it when your blood is thin. How do you make your blood thin? You drink two litres of water a day. And on a day like today, whoa, I didn't realise New Zealand got this hot. <laughs> it is. It's a, it was a beautiful day. On a day like today, we need to be sipping a lot of water. And did you try that salt? You see, because the more you perspire, the more salt that you, you lose. It's not rocket science, is it? And as I showed you last night, the misconception has come because of this refined salt, only containing two minerals, but we need all the minerals. So it is in that way that the... Sorry, it's not wonderful. I can rub it off. <laughs> it is in that way that your lungs and your kidneys are constantly monitoring and balancing the pH of your blood. So the pH of your blood cannot change, as you can see. No need to have your pH of your blood tested, because it'll be the same. But the pH at the cellular level can change. Now, the pH at the cellular level should be approximately 6.5. Now, that's very slightly acid, and there is a reason for that. You see, the most acidic substance is sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid travels at the speed of light. The most alkaline mineral is calcium. And on the scale of speed, calcium doesn't even move. So it's a speed thing. Let me give you an illustration. The hydroponic gardener is always testing the pH of the water that the roots of his plants sit in because if the water goes too acid, the roots burn. If the water goes too alkaline, he doesn't get the speed of uptake of minerals out of the water and into the plant. Can you see it's a speed thing? Now let's go to our cell. Now we've been going into the CBD, the central business district of the human body. Do you remember? We'll just do a half cell today, half cell. Remember the glucose goes in and there's a 20-step pathway? Okay, students, how much energy does that give us? Two units of energy. 
End result of that 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into the powerhouse, called the powerhouse, because this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight step pathway delivers for us a whopping 36 units of energy. Did you experience that this morning after your morning walk, run, hills? So it's an eight step pathway, eight little chemical reactions. But actually what's happening is, that's an oxygen pathway. What's happening is every chemical reaction you're getting sometimes three units of energy, sometimes four units of energy. So at every chemical reaction it's giving off that energy. Now if the cellular level is getting too acid, that's all going too fast. If at the cellular level it's going too slow, it's all going too slow. And our body runs according to precision balance. Can you see why? Ideally the cell is slightly acid so you get that speed of working in all your little chemical reactions. The gardener aims for a soil pH of 6.4. Very close to the cell. The Bible says in Genesis 3.19, we come from dust, we go back to dust, we're dust. Interesting to note that the soil and the cell, very similar pH. But in a cellular pH of 5.5, that is where cancer thrives. And in a cellular pH of 5.5, this is where fungus thrives. And earlier in the week, we looked at the fungal link with many diseases. Where does Coca-Cola sit? 2.6. That's Coke. And it might come as a great surprise to you, but some people drink it. It's true. Many are sick through ignorance. They don't realise it. You have a look at Coca-Cola, the most fantastic advertising campaign that's ever been embarked on surrounds Coca-Cola. And you know why? Because they've got nothing else. <laughs> it's a poison. It's probably good to clean the oil off your cement pathway. I, I can't think of anything else that it has any use for. I don't know about you, but some of my family and my friends break every law of health every day. Let's have a quick look at these laws. Law number one is pure air. And if someone's breathing in bad air, especially while they're sleeping, we spend a third of our life in there, mouldy pillows. Has everyone had a look at their pillows? Today was a good day, yeah, to put your pillows and your quilts out in that sun. Where I'm sleeping at the moment, my bed and Amelia's bed, we've got twin beds there, flood with sun in the morning. Very, very nice. It's wonderful if the sunshine can get into that bedroom. You see, we spend a lot of time in that bedroom. So if you've got trees around your bedroom window, cut them down. You've got to have nice, pure air while you're breathing. Bad air, which basically is usually mouldy, laden air, creates an acid condition. Law number two is sunshine. And I'm sure everyone got their vitamin D today. Too much sunshine, not enough sunshine, creates an acid condition. Number three. Number three is called temperance. I'll just make a no list. And we've looked at a few no's. The foods that we should not be having is refined sugar. We've looked at, at the wheat. We've looked at caffeine alcohol, cigarettes, they all create a very acid condition. So number four, law is rest. Too much sleep, not enough sleep, both create an acid condition. Just the right amount, alkaline condition. Number five is exercise. Six hours of aerobic exercise a day will create an acid condition. But most people are guilty of no exercise and that can create an acid condition. Law number six is proper diet. 
Last night we looked at foods. We looked at foods also when we looked at diabetes and we'll also be looking at foods tonight from the acid alkaline angle. So the right amount or the proper food that will give an alkaline environment is vegetables. Vegetables are the most alkaline foods. We'll define that in a minute. Law number seven is water. We've looked at this a few times. Very important to drink adequate water. I haven't met anyone who drinks too much water yet. In fact, Dr. Christopher in America, he said, here's a sign to see if you're drinking too much water. Put your head on the side and if the water comes out your ears. In other words, it's almost impossible to drink too much water. The only way you can drink too much water if you're not also having adequate salt. And the eighth law is trust in divine power. So basically, trusting in divine power takes in all the emotional really mental and spiritual aspects of disease. And you can have someone doing, don't know where that came from, should be power. You can be doing everything all right. You can be going to bed early, have a nice clean bedroom. You can be uh, eating the right food. You can be exercising. But if you're totally stressed out and anxious about everything, that can create an acid condition. There's a beautiful verse in Philippians and says, Be anxious in nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? And there's another one in Isaiah 26 verse 3. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, he whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. That's an alkaline condition. So... Some of my family and friends break every law every day. Lungs and kidneys are challenged. They're struggling. And then on top of that, the person has a can of Coke or a coffee with a few teaspoons of sugar. Lungs and kidneys were already challenged. Blood pH starts to drop 7.35, 7.34, 7.33. Alarm bells go off and the last resort buffer system is called on. Calcium, the most alkaline mineral, is pulled out of its biggest storage house. Where's that? The bones. It comes into the blood in a form of calcium phosphate. It's like a crystal form. It immediately alkalizes that rising acid environment in the blood. 7.33, 34, 35. We're safe, but at a cost. We now have these calcium crystals floating through the blood. What's the body going to do with it? It'll settle it in the joints as gout, arthritis. It'll settle it uh, in the kidneys, kidney stones, uh, gallbladder, gallstones. It'll contribute to the building up in the arteries. It'll, uh, it'll also um, go on your bones as bone spurs. You've heard of bone spurs? If anyone's had a bone spur, they're very, very painful things. But tomorrow afternoon between 6 and 8, I'm going to be demonstrating natural remedies and I'll show you how to make a castor oil compress which can break down a bone spur. Isn't that good news? These are all illustrations of Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. But what probably affects the acid alkaline more than anything that else that we do really is the food that we eat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a list of alkaline forming foods and I'm going to make a list of acid forming foods. The most alkaline forming food that you can put into your body is the lemon. And you might say, no, no, the lemon's acid. Well, it's acid where it should be. There is only one part of your body that should be acid. Where's that, students? Stomach. stomach. In fact, if someone says to me, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, fantastic. It should be, because that's the only thing that can break up all those little chemical bonds in your protein. You see, it's in the stomach that protein's broken down, and that's how we break up the protein into amino acids. And then I say, but how do you know it's acid? Well, I can feel it. So my next uh, statement is, 
well, you mustn't have a very good lining on your stomach because I can't feel my acid. Well, why would someone had a thin lining on their stomach because of dehydration? Our, our stomach has a thick mucosal lining on it. And when we're dehydrated, that's one of the first places that the lining is taken from. Because in dehydration, our body goes into a form of drought management. You see, full blood volume must be kept in the major arteries and veins. And so what the body does says, well, we'll take a bit from here, we'll take a bit from there. And one of the first places it takes from is the thick lining that coats the stomach. Another person said to me, well, I know I have an acid stomach. The acid keeps coming up. Hmm. Why would the acid keep coming up? You've got two very good gates there. Let me show you why. So many people today, they have their large meal at the end of the day. You see, we should be having breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper. And a lot of people have breakfast like the pauper, lunch like the pauper, and the tea is the king and the queen together. Hmm? And then they sit down on the easy chair in front of the television and what happens within 10 minutes, they're fast asleep and they go to bed. And let's have a look at their stomach. This is, stomach on, this is what stomach looks like when you're sleeping. And instead of, instead of being like this, where the food's like this and bit by bit going through here, where's the food now because of gravity? It's like this, and these two little gates here, it pushes and pushes, and like the dripping tap on a stone, weakens that little gate. It's called the, it's called the cardiac sphincter. Cardiac, because it's so close to where your heart is, that's why it's called the cardiac sphincter. And the cardiac sphincter is a muscle, and when the muscle is relaxed, it's closed. But, so it's like this, there's the muscle, your cardiac sphincter basically looks like that. And when it tightens, it opens. So if someone's stressed out and their muscles tighten, what happens to the cardiac sphincter? It tightens too. So there are two main things that cause reflux or heartburn. And one is eating too late at night. And the other is, on top of that, the stress. Everyone that comes to Misty Mountain Health Retreat with reflux or uh, heartburn goes home without it because we serve breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper. And if they have a reflux problem, I give them magnesium four times a day with each, well, with the two main meals, with the thin soup we serve at night and then just before bed and they have no more. Now, what most people go on if they have reflux is Nexium. You've heard of Nexium? And all Nexium does is stop the acid, so the acid doesn't come up. But that makes no sense at all. What's going to break the protein down now? And do you know what research is showing? People that have been on long-term Nexium, are f they're finding that they are more susceptible to colon cancer because the food's not getting broken down properly in the stomach. It gets down to the large colon Excess bacteria has to be made to deal with the partially digested protein that actually can start damaging the wall of the colon. Hmm. And when someone says to me, I've been on Nexium 10 years, is it working? Hmm? Is it working? <laughs> I'd like to suggest not, because if the body's designed to heal itself, it should heal. It should heal very, very quickly. It will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. So back to the stomach. The stomach should be acid. But when the lemon goes into the gastrointestinal tract, the enzymes break the lemon down to two singular particles. One's glucose and one's fructose. Then they're absorbed into the blood. Then the blood takes it to the main uh, project manager, liver. And then the liver breaks the fructose down to glucose and the glucose gets sent to the cell. We're following the journey of the glucose from the lemon. Comes through the 20-step pathway, comes into the 8-step pathway. This pathway, this little pathway, is often called 
the furnace. It's also called the powerhouse. For those technical amongst us, this is the glycolytic pathway, this is the mitochondria with the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle is basically that little eight-step pathway. So the glucose and the oxygen are burnt in there to give off the energy. And all matter on planet Earth, when it is burnt, leaves an ash. Mm -hmm. And the ash that's left in the cell can be the acid or alkaline, depending on the food we eat. Lemon is acid where it should be in the stomach, and it is alkaline where it should be, which is down at the cell. What determines? What determines the difference? It is the mineral composition of the plant or the food. So these foods here are high in the alkaline minerals, which is sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron. They are the main alkaline minerals, and these foods are high in those alkaline minerals, so they're burnt at the cell, they leave an alkaline ash. That's why these foods here are the alkaline forming foods. Mm -hmm. And these foods, which we will look at in a minute, are the acid forming foods. Well, what minerals do they have? They have sulfur, which is an acid mineral, and chlorine, and phosphorus. They're the acid forming minerals. Let's move on our alkaline list. Dark green leafy vegetables. Dark green leafy vegetables are very high in the alkaline minerals. We should be eating dark green leafy vegetables every single day. Have you had a nice big dark green salad today? Some people say, oh, but it's hard in the winter when it's cold. Well, you can heat up your salad with cayenne pepper and crushed garlic. I can assure you it'll heat it up. You see, raw food will deliver what cooked won't, and cooked will deliver what raw won't. We need to be having, well, what I aim for is I aim for a 50 cooked and a 50 raw, and that will give a nice balance. Whether the food be cooked or whether the food be raw, it doesn't change the acid alkaline because it's the minerals in the plant that determine how it is burnt in the cell. Vegetables. Vegetables also have an alkaline effect. Now, before I define vegetables, let me just go back to dark green leafy vegetables. Now, this explains why things like green barley, spirulina, wheatgrass, green smoothies have been, become popular because they are so alkaline. And as you can see from here, it is an acid environment basically that breeds disease. So we can do a lot to alkaline the tissues of our body by eating more greens. Vegetables. Most vegetables are alkaline forming, but there is a question mark with one group of vegetables. So one group of vegetables for some people has an acid effect, and for some people it has an alkaline effect. That's the tomato, it's the nightshade group of vegetables. Capsicum, in two weeks I'll be lecturing in America and I can't say capsicum, I have to say bell pepper. They don't know what a capsicum is. But I think here in New Zealand you call it capsicum, yeah? Sweet pepper. And potato, and I'm not referring to the sweet potato, but in New Zealand you call it kumara, don't you? But in Australia we call it the sweet potato. I'm not referring to that, I'm referring to what's commonly called the Irish potato. These are from the nightshade family, and if someone has an inflammatory condition in their body and they eat these foods, it can accelerate the inflammation. Let me give you the story of a lady and her husband that came to our health retreat. They were in their probably early to mid-70s. And the lady said to me, do you know, uh, two years ago, we booked ourselves into an aged care facility. She said we were late 60s. 
She said, we're both a, bit, both a bit overweight. She said, I had quite a bit of arthritis. My husband had some gout. And our daughter gave us a set of your DVDs. She said, we watch them. We learn about exercise, drinking more water, breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper. Uh, we heard the acid alkaline and about the nightshades and we thought, we're retired now, we can do what we want. Let's give this a go. She said within six months, they'd both lost 10 kilos. She said the pain from her arthritis had gone. She was off all her medication. Even the joints were going back to normal. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> the joints in a lady in her late 60s are going back to normal. She said, we booked out of aged care. She said, we bought a big van and a car and we decided to travel Australia. And they got to uh, mid-east coast, came into our health retreat, which is about an hour off the highway, and spend a week with us doing our health program. You could not wipe the smile off this lady's face. She said, I'm early 70s now. She said, I feel better now than I felt in my 40s. How many people don't realise how good they could feel? Life should be good. Right up till the day we die. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there is a formula. She said to me, I haven't eaten any of these foods for a year now, for over a year now. She said, do you think I could start eating them? I said, give it a try. Who will tell her? Her body will tell her. How will her body tell her? Well, some people say as soon as they eat some of those foods, the joints start aching. One lady said, well, my joints don't ache straight away, but it repeats on me. So there are different ways that it may speak to you. My mother died at 51, a cripple in a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis. She was wheelchair bound for the last six years of her life. Now I have strong inherited genes towards rheumatoid arthritis. I have a loaded gun, but I'm not gonna pull the trigger. Remember, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. My mother did not know that her cups of tea and her white bread and her white biscuits and her meat, as you will see, she didn't realise that she was eating all the acid foods. So many people are sick through ignorance. Isn't that right? Every now and then, some of my joints start knocking. What do I mean like that? Well, I've, my left knee sometimes knocks. You see, when I was 50, I did a... I did a skydive with my daughter for her, let's see, she, she was 20, I was 50. She wanted me to do a skydive with her for her birthday, so I did. And I didn't land quite right, and I was on crutches. <laughs> Something happened to the foot. Now, that, that foot's perfect now, all healed. But because I put so much weight on this knee, I think this knee was a bit challenged. And every now and then, that joint gets a little sore. Now, when it gets sore, what's my body saying? Excuse me, um, could you do something here? So whenever it gets sore, I might drastically drop the nightshades, concentrate more on the alkaline foods, and I usually take high-dose uh, turmeric. And then after about a... A month, it stops again. It's perfectly all right now. And that's what you'll find every now and again, and it's usually because of our genetic weaknesses, there'll be a little knock. How nice to know what you can do to relieve that knock because you know what the drugs do. We've got a knock. All the drugs do is they quieten it. But what's still happening even though you can't hear it? It's deteriorating more and more. So there's a question mark. I don't know what your body will say to you. This is what my body says to me. A little tomato. Organic, I can handle. Homegrown, most days. Capsicum, my body says, don't even think about it. Now, I choose not to eat it, but if I have a dish with capsicum in it, it repeats on me all afternoon and my energy levels just go bang. We were at, uh, Amelia and I were in Devonport today, a friend took us around, and we had Mexican for lunch. And it was a nice kidney bean stew with avocado. 
And I looked at Amelia and I went, oh, I forgot to ask if there was capsicum. But there wasn't. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> I don't choose to eat it, but sometimes I'll have a dish with it in before I realise it. And my body says to me again, got to keep off this one. Do you know the day might come when I can eat a bit? I never used to be able to eat tomatoes at all, but now I can eat a little bit. I'm just telling you what me, my body says to me. Your body will speak to you. Now let's say I've got 10 professors of nutrition in front of me saying, this is ridiculous. Capsicum is an excellent food. It's high in antioxidants, high in vitamin C. You should be eating it. Who am I going to listen to? Well, I'm the one that lives in here, aren't I? You see, you are the best person to be your doctor because only you know how you feel, only you know how your body responds or reacts to different things, and only you know what your body likes and does not like. And if your body says, that was good, go with it. If your body says, mm, back off, back off. And what you can eat today, you may not be able to eat in six months. And what you can't eat today, you might be able to eat in six months. You keep testing and trying. But if the body speaks, listen. Because if you don't speak to the first little tap, what happens to the taps? <laughs> they get louder and louder, trying to get your attention. Drugs don't cure disease. They just change the form and location of it. We've got to listen. We've got to act now. And tomorrow afternoon when I go through the natural remedies, I'll be showing you a lot of wonderful little things that can ease Nox. I know if my knee has been sore, I grate up ginger, wrap it in a poultice. I'll show you how to do that tomorrow afternoon. Cover it with plastic and wrap it on. And, ah, oh, that brings such relief. Just a simple ginger poultice there. There are lots of little things you can do to bring relief without having to go to, to harmful medications. So I don't know what your body will say to you. If you have arthritis and you love that food, I will still advise you stop it until your arthritis is conquered. A lady said to me one day, but I love that food. I said, well, how much do you love your arthritis? And it's not forever. It's just until you conquer it. So the question mark remains. My husband loves potato. He's an Irishman. He has about five times the potato that I have. So you might make some adjustments. One lady said, I can have raw capsicum but not cooked. Another lady said, I can have cooked but not raw. Another lady said, I can have red but not green. And another lady said, well, I can have the green and not the red. I love these stories. What are they stories of? People who are listening. People who are listening to what their body says. Fruit has a question mark. Why does fruit have a question mark? If someone has a yeast presence in their body, the sugar in the fruit will feed the yeast because it's its favourite food. And if you're not going to give refined sugar to the yeast, it'll happily accept the sugar in the fruit. And as it feeds on the sugar in the fruit, it goes off lactic acid. It gives off uric acid. Sorry, that shouldn't be there. That should be acid. Lactic acid, uric acid, acetic acid, and alcohol. So can you see what yeast does? It feathers its nest. So the more fruit a person eats that have a yeast problem, the more acid is created and this creates the environment that yeast and fungus love. On Tuesday night, we looked at the link between cancer and fungus. So when someone comes to me wanting help to conquer cancer, I take them off all fruit for six weeks. One lady said, but Barbara, God made fruit good. I said, oh, he sure did. Fruit is wonderful. <laughs> but if someone has a condition in their body that that's got a high yeast presence, they need to either greatly reduce it or stop it for a, ser uh, for a period of time. So cancer is a very serious condition and it needs serious steps to conquer it. The good news is we've seen many have a total turnaround from cancer. Isn't that good news? All you need is the right conditions. If someone comes to me with cancer, I say, well, I've seen three outcomes. 
Number one, I've seen turnarounds. Number two, I've seen six months go to six years. Number three, I've seen the last days made more comfortable. It all depends on how serious, how advanced it is. And we had one poor girl, only 33, come from Quebec. And she had very advanced breast cancer. And she was in so much pain and so much discomfort. All the things that we usually can do, we can or could not do to her. <laughs> We're so sad. All we actually could do was go to the local doc and get her some more painkillers. And I think she passed away a month later. Ideally, she would have come to us when she had the first little lump. By the time she came to us, <clears throat> the breast was the size of a boulder and it was rock hard with the skin breaking down. <laughs> too late, too late. Now, we, we always do what we can, but, you know, when someone is very advanced, it's, it's very difficult. All you can really do is try and make them more comfortable. So fruit has a question mark. How do you know if you have a yeast presence? And by the way, you can have a yeast presence and not have cancer. But if it is not addressed, it certainly can develop to that. One of the clearest signs is a white tongue. Tongues should be pink. Now, if you're detoxing, there might be a layer of white that you can scrape off. That's not yeast, that's waste. But if there is a white presence on your tongue and you cannot scrape it up, it's usually little fungus buds. But probably the most common symptoms are things like um, thrush, uh, that's vaginal thrush or anal thrush or jock itch or uh, athlete's foot, tinea, uh, fungus toenails, psoriasis, eczema. They also can be uh, yeast, yeast problems and also uh, sinus. That's a very common yeast one. So they are some of, the, some of the things. There is a formula and if you give the body the right f formula, you can get a, a healing condition. One lady, she went on grapefruit, nothing but grapefruit for her fruit, because it's very low sugar, for 18 months. 18 months? Well, she'd had the problem for 30 years, so 18 months is pretty good. Didn't take her 30 years to, <laughs> to conquer, but it did take her 18 months. She says today, eight years later, that she's never felt so good. So it depends. Depends on the severity, depends on how long it's been around, and it also very much dependent. There's no use going on a, a candida diet, a, a yeast-free and low-fruit diet with the herbs, and you're still breathing in mould every night. So that definitely has to be assessed. So fruit has a question mark. The most alkaline legumes are lima beans and lentils, and soy. Soy is only a problem if it's been genetically modified and if it's been uh, grown with herbicides, insecticides. But if you buy organic soy, and probably the way we mostly have it maybe is tofu, if it's organic, and you can buy organic tofu in most supermarkets, then um, it should not have genetically modified because if an organic farmer uses genetically modified seed, he loses his organic status. Millet. Millet is the most alkaline grain. What's millet? Bird seed. What do the budgies do? Spit out the hull and eat the kernel. Well, you can buy hulled millet and it cooks up to a, a very nice porridge. But instead of two cups of water, water to one cup of grain. With millet, it's about three cups of water to one cup of grain. It's the most alkaline and it's also gluten-free. Another grain that is alkaline and gluten-free is quinoa, usually called quinoa. Another one is buckwheat. The Polish love their buckwheat. Aussies and New Zealanders take a bit more time to get used to it, but buckwheat pancakes are delicious. And amaranth. Amaranth is a grain that is not well known, but it's getting popular because it's gluten-free. And it's about the size of a grain of sand. And if you cook it up like a porridge, it goes like a lump of glug, and it's not very nice. But you can put some amaranth with your millet if you're having that as a porridge. You can put some amaranth with quinoa. You see, amaranth is phenomenally high in calcium, 
in protein, so it's an excellent grain. You can also have it as a flour um, in some gluten-free mixes. If you do buckwheat pancakes, you can put a bit of amaranth in there. It'll help to bind it. Spelt and kamut. Now, the first four grains are gluten-free, whereas these two have a very fragile gluten structure. So let me give you the wheat story. I will go over it again, and I did last night, but I'm going to go into it in a bit more detail tonight. And for those who weren't here last night, um, I'm going to give it again. When God made wheat, that, that wheat was called inkhorn wheat, and it had a very fragile protein or gluten structure. Fragile protein or gluten structure means very easy to be broken down in the grinding, in the cooking, in the enzymes in them and the chewing. Fragile structure means easily broken down, easily digested. A few thousand years ago, that inkhorn did a, did a wild hybrid with a field grass and came up with the emma wheat. So the emma is another strain of wheat. That structure's not as fragile, but it's still fairly fragile. In the 1950s, emma wheat was put through intensive crossbreeding. Dr. Norman Bulag and a team of scientists in Mexico put emma wheat through intensive crossbreeding to produce a plant with a very high yield. At first, the stalk just broke and they lost their crop. So they went back to the drawing board and they came with a, a plant that only grows this high. It has a very thick stem and a very high yield. Now it can hold the yield. Some farmers are saying they're getting 10 times more grain per acre compared to the old Emma strain of wheat. No wonder the farmers love it. 1969, Dr. Norman Bulag got a Nobel Prize for his hybridised wheat. 1970s, went worldwide. So by the 1990s, in America, England, Australia, all over the world, New Zealand, every wheat, every pasta, every cereal, every biscuit, every cake, every donut, what's it made out of? The hybridised wheat. Let me show you the gluten or the protein structure of the hybridised wheat. You see, no one complains that the starvation crisis was relieved with this grain, and the farmers love it, but what was never addressed was the effect of this grain on the human body. And what it created was an incredibly complex protein or gluten structure. And it's almost only a cast iron gut that can break that down. Now, if that hybridised wheat is made into a sourdough bread, the culturing process in the sourdough bread breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain and makes it a little bit more fragile. But it's still not as fragile as this. You can still get field hybrids from this emma wheat. It's called spelt and kumut. Now, spelt and kumut both have that original fragile structure that emma wheat had. And if you make the spelt or the kamut into a sourdough bread, it breaks down the structure even more so you can bring it back to that original inkhorn structure. Now, celiacs, what's a celiac? That's a severe gluten intolerance. They can't even handle the spelt. But someone who is tolerant, tolerant just means, um, so gluten intolerant means not as severe as celiac. They can probably have uh, half a slice of bread a week. They don't react as much, but they're still best of it. Whereas gluten sensitive means they can probably have a slice of bread twice a week, but certainly not like many Aussies and New Zealanders are doing it. Uh, cereal and toast for breakfast, cake mid-morning, sandwiches for lunch, cake mid-afternoon, pasta for tea. What's that? That's almost 100% of this hybridised wheat. No wonder there's so much gluten intolerance. 
many people don't realise they have gluten intolerance. Let me list some of the symptoms of a gluten intolerance. Sinus, hay fever, allergies, asthma, eczema, psoriasis, irritable bowel, constipation, brain fog. Got that? <laughs> How many people have brain fog? We used to have a cook working for us. He was Fijian, 19. I could tell when he was eating gluten because he'd forget everything. And I'd be talking to him at nine in the morning and he's yawning and he's 19. I said, Zach, have you been eating wheat? And he'd go, <laughs> he couldn't hide it. When he wasn't eating wheat, whoa, he was sparky. Many people don't realise how good life could be. How many people blame it on the fact that they've just turned 40? Huh? Or just turned 50? 50 is only halfway to 100. Huh? He's not old. Many people suffer from the symptoms of a gluten intolerance. There's only one way to check if you are sensitive or intolerant or celiac, and that is to stop all wheat for two months. Two months? Well, you can eat a slice of bread and it'll be out of your body in 24 hours, but the effect can remain for up to six weeks. Well, what do you do after two months? Well, <clears throat> how do you feel? <laughs> if you feel good, stay on it. What's the, uh, well, an old Aussie saying is if you're on a good thing, stick to it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Two months is not long. Make a note on your calendar. If you want to do this, don't do it until the wheat's out of your house and all the millets and the quinoas and the buckwheats and the spelt bread's in the freezer. <laughs> then start. Make it easy on yourself. No wonder there's so much gluten intolerance, but there's more. Aussies are just, and New Zealanders, they're just overdoing the wheat. And as I showed you on the diabetic night, it's this overload of this wheat that is a big contributing factor to the diabetic pandemic that we're seeing today. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's nothing short of a crisis, I should say. Nothing short of a crisis. So many. But there's more. The wheat in Australia is grown with superphosphate. It kills the microorganisms in the soil, locks up the calcium in the soil. So the wheat is deficient in all the basic coenzymes that are required to digest it. <coughs> There's more. Children are being fed food too young. See, the first teeth we get is four at the bottom, four at the top, and they're called milk teeth. Do you know why they're called milk teeth? That's all babies should have. You find a lactation consultant, you find a, a, a nurse that's been a nurse for 50 years and she will tell you that when she was a young nurse, babies were just fed milk. Well, what's this big thrust to feed babies food? Some babies are being fed food and they haven't even got any teeth. How That defies reason. One lady said, my baby won't chew. I said, does your baby have any teeth? No, well, no wonder it won't chew. Huh? It's like a young Fijian girl. She said, my baby's crying all night. How old's your baby? Five months. Does your baby have any teeth? She said, no. I said, well, the baby, are you giving the baby any food? I just started today. I said, why? My auntie and my mother and the old ladies and the baby health centre said I must be giving my baby food. Now here's this roly-poly, gorgeous-looking baby that's obviously thriving well on just the breast milk. I said, no, the baby has no teeth. Oh, she said. I saw her a week later because I was in Fiji for two weeks. I said, how's your baby? She said, very happy. I said, are you giving the baby food? No, no food, no food. And oh, how easy is that, not having to make food for baby? I said, what did your auntie and your grandmother and your mother say? They said, why aren't you giving the baby food? She said, but the baby has no teeth. And they were silenced. It defies reason. You know there's been a death and no one attended the funeral because no one knew he'd died? It was the death of common sense. Mm. 
But let me tell you how serious this thing is. A baby doesn't get molars, they're the next ones, until the baby is anywhere between 16 and 20 months of age. And when the molars come through, and what are molars? They grind. The, the little glands in the mouth now produce tylen. Tylen is an amylase. It's the enzyme that breaks down starch. Now, do you know what this means? A baby has no ability to break down starch till they have molars. So all the babies that are being fed, and it's not the mother's fault, they're just doing what they're told, and the mother just wants to do the best by her baby. But the babies are being fed this pulverized slop. Sorry, I'm not interested in eating slop. I never made baby food. I never gave my babies any food till they had teeth. Now, when they had the four at the top, the four at the bottom, maybe a couple at the top, I used to give them little bits. That's taste time. Say a corn, a cob of corn with all the corn eaten off it, and they suck away on that, or a hunk of celery, or a hunk of apple in a net bag, just little suck things, little taste times. But they really weren't eating anything to speak of till they were about 16 months of age. In fact, my daughter Emma, she's got twin girls, they're 10 and 11 now, but when they were both 16 months old, they had not tasted food. You never hear such a thing, do you? They were, these little ones are running down and they'd never tasted food. She said, one's got teeth, the other hasn't, so I'm not going to give it to one without the other. <laughs> she was breastfeeding them and, and she certainly used to drink about eight litres of water a day, I think, <laughs> to make enough milk for those babies. hundred years ago, babies didn't eat food. Did you know that? It's a recent phenomenon. Who's going to make money out of the mother that starts feeding her baby food at four months of age? Can you see that, the baby food companies? One mother rang me up. She said, my first baby, I used to give it food everywhere I went. I had to have little containers. She said, this baby, I'm not doing any of that. It's so easy. <laughs> One lady said, but my baby keeps grabbing for food. They'll eat anything. They'll eat caterpillars. They'll eat... It's not that they're hungry. That's how they taste things. They'll put their big toes in their mouth. That's not the guide. The guide that a baby is ready to eat is it can sit, it can put things in its mouth, and it has the teeth to chew it. It's as simple as that. That's another reason why we're having this gluten intolerance. Because babies are being fed too young and malabsorption syndrome is being setting up in the gut because food is reaching the intestines that has not been broken down. But there's another problem. Let me show you this. This is the villi that line our gastrointestinal tract. And as I showed you the other day, there is a thick turf wall lining our gastrointestinal tract. And it's made out of lactobacillus acidophilus and bifidus bacterium. Actually, it's made out of trillions, but those two are the permanent ones that all are made from. There's a literal jungle down there, <clears throat> or should be. But there are things that are knocking off our friendly flora. Antibiotics, knock it off. Cortisone drugs, knock it off. Uh, Neurofin painkillers, knock it off. Contraceptive pill, statin drugs, they're all your cholesterol-lowering medication. They knock off the gut flora. Now, these cells here are nourished by the gut flora. That's a happy cell. That's an unhappy cell. No gut flora to nourish it. When this hybridized wheat comes down into the gut, it's broken down to glutomorphine. What's morphine? It's an opiate derivative. So let's have a look at this. There's gluto, there's morphine. Glutomorphine comes here, and this happy cell because it's nourished and strong, it can knock off the morphine and only gluto gets in. But if glutomorphine comes here, that cell, because it's not properly nourished, it can't knock off morphine and so glutomorphine gets into the blood, glutomorphine goes to the brain and the opiate receptor sites on the brain pick it up 
and it's contributing to mental illness. There are two books that show this in detail. One is by a neurologist, his name's Dr. Ta David Pertmuller, it's called Grain Brain. And he shows the effect on this common hybridized wheat grain and it's contributing to mental illness. How scary is that? He gives stories of psychiatrists who've taken bipolar schizophrenic patients off wheat and they get a 50% improvement. The other book is by a Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride called Gut and Psychology. She looks at the gut and this breakdown of the gut from so many medications combined with this hybridized wheat. See, both these doctors have decades of clinical practice up their sleeve showing very, very clearly that this hybridized wheat is not just causing thrush, is just not causing allergies, is just not causing hay fever, but it's also contributing to mental illness. Now, it is well documented that if you take an autistic child off wheat, off dairy, off refined sugar, they will get a 50% improvement. And Dr. Bruce Fife, in his book, Stop Autism Now, he explores that very well and in, in a lot of detail. Wow. So this hybridized wheat, it's worth trying, isn't it? <laughs> and there are so many alternatives today. I say to people, start exploring the other grains. Start giving your body the requirements that it would love to give you optimum performance. This is just not optimum performance in your body, but also in your mind. In protein, they're the highest in calcium and they're the highest in iron. And I think that's why they probably make it into a milk now and uh, you get almond milk. If someone has a baby, I would never suggest they give the almond milk from the shop to the baby. It's not formulated for a baby. In fact, if a baby cannot have breast milk, the milk that is the closest to breast milk is goat's milk. So if a mother cannot feed the baby, the goat's milk is the best. There are a lot of babies who have ax eczema, asthma, ear problems, all because they're on cow's milk. Now, cow's milk is perfect milk for baby calves. Did you hear that? That's it. And the milk that's in the formula is uh, homogenized and pasteurized. And if homogenized and pasteurized milk is given to a baby calf, did you know that calf will die? So it is not the best milk for babies. So if a mother cannot breastfeed, the goat's milk is the next best. I do know a mother who gave her baby carrot, sorry, and apple juice instead of milk. Now, this baby could not have any type of milk, could not even handle her milk. And this baby had a skin disease where the, the skin was just falling off every day. Um, there were layers of skin coming off the baby, had a terrible skin condition. And the naturopath put this baby on carrot, sorry, and apple juice. That's 80% carrot, 10% celery. 10% apple, and the baby thrived on that. So it's often called the vegetarian's milk. Now in Fiji, traditionally, they've always given babies boo juice. Now boo juice is the milk in the immature coconut, not the mature coconut, the immature coconut, because in the immature coconut, all the nutrients are in the, in the fluid. And if you open an immature coconut, you get a thin, soft, white jelly lining. That's the immature coconut. And all the nutrients are in there. But in a mature coconut, all the nutrients are on the thick, hard, white uh, wall. And that's what coconut cream and coconut milk and coconut oil are made out of that thick coat. But... I have known a mother to give her baby almond milk and she would uh, blend up the almonds and dates with a bit of water and strain it and the baby went well on that. But if a mother can't feed her baby, she's best to go to the uh, 
goat, goat's milk, and if she can't go to that, it's probably almost best that she be under a nutritionist just to get the right milk for that baby. I've been uh, helping a lady in New York, and her little baby has two teeth, and this little one's 18 months old. And he's just, they had him on huge amounts of food, and his stomach just swells, and his arms are thin. And I said, the baby should be still having milk because the baby only has a few teeth. So she's had to cut the food right back and give the baby most of the nutrients via milk. And she's been giving the carrot, sorry, and apple juice to this little one. And his stomach has gone right down. And sometimes that can happen. They can say, he's so thin, so you give heaps amount of food, but the gut has to heal before the, the stomach can handle that food. Anyway, they're quite excited how the baby's beginning to respond. So every case is different. But almond is called the king of all nuts. It's the most alkaline nut. It's the highest in protein, the highest in calcium, and the highest in iron. Brazil nuts are also an alkaline nut. Now, Brazil nuts are phenomenally high in selenium. And selenium is a very important mineral. You see, the... the um, the thyroid needs selenium because it needs selenium to convert iodine into thyroxine. Now, mercury has an affinity for selenium. So if people have mercury fillings in their mouth, that can gobble up all their selenium. You only need five Brazil nuts a day to get all the selenium that you need for a day. And even though in Australia the selenium levels in the soil are very low, we get our Brazil nuts from Brazil. <laughs> and of course, in Brazil, the, the land is okay. All your seeds, that's uh, sesame seeds, sunflowers, uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, they are also on the alkaline list. The most acid-forming substance you can put in your body, I'm sorry, I cannot call it a food because I consider it a poison, and that is the pure crystallized acid that's been extracted from the sugar cane plant. It's a highly concentrated substance, whether it be white, whether it be tan, or whether it be brown. And one of the problems, well, another problem with sugar today is it's highly sprayed because the bugs attack it because the sugar cane is grown in the same ground again and again and again. So the ground is very depleted in nutrients. So there are many reasons why sugar should never be eaten. And there is no need for us to eat sugar. We've got beautiful sweeteners like honey, maple syrup, uh, You've also got coconut sugar or palm sugars. That's just the crystallized nectar from the palm flower. So there are, are many uh, sweeteners so you don't have to go to the poison. Uh, meat. Meat is very high in the, alkali in the acid minerals. When meat breaks down in the body, it gives off a high sulfur waste. And this creates a very acid condition. In his book, The China Study, Dr. Colin Campbell he explains that in detail. He says he could turn cancer on and off like a switch depending on how much meat and dairy products he was giving the rats. The book is called The China Study because in China they're able to compare the city Chinese to the country Chinese who are still eating the native food. So they get this clear comparison there. And the cancer rates in the cities are about the same as in the industrialised nations. Your hybridised wheat, the hybridisation of the wheat created, uh, it, it changed the molecular structure of the wheat so that there are more acid-forming minerals. Aged cheese. Notice we didn't give you any blue vein cheese to nibble on. What's the blue in the blue vein cheese? is mould. Mould is very acid, so there's your, your acid environment. But I put over here, pH of 7, are fresh cheeses. So this is feta. This is uh, ricotta and cottage. These are fresh cheeses, so they don't have the acid effect. I myself choose not to, although sometimes if I'm travelling and there's not much to offer, I might have a little feta. But you can get some very nice goat and even sheep fetters today. 
Also, caffeine, all your caffeine foods and drinks create an acid environment. Alcohol, it's not a food, but it creates an acid environment. Tobacco's not a food, but it creates an acid environment. All your other grains, all your other legumes, and all your other nuts other than the ones on the alkaline side. Now, two maintain the 6.5 environment at the cellular level, we should be having 20 to 30 percent acid forming foods and 70 to 80 percent alkaline forming foods. Now this 20 to 30 percent ideally should be from this little section here. How many people today are eating 90% acid, 10% alkaline. Mm -hmm. This is the diet I just uh, described before. Cereal and toast for breakfast, sandwiches for lunch, pasta for tea, maybe biscuits, cakes, mid-morning, mid-afternoon. That's almost 100% acid. The easiest way to alkalize your food program is to eat more vegetables, more greens. Start pursuing the other grains. That's the easiest way to do it. That's the easiest way to keep the balance. One lady said, oh, no, rice is here. I said, yes, rice isn't bad. You need a little acid. Walnuts are here. Yeah, walnuts are great. I love them. And you need a little acid. You see, it's all a matter of balance. And if you're having a lot of fresh veggies, greens, have a highly alkaline diet, you can handle a little bit of the acid ones. Macadamia lots, how I love them. They're perfectly fine. You need a little acid. It's just the balance. So what, one of the easiest ways is to be mindful of more veggies. If you don't have a yeast problem, fruits, over to these, these, these uh, legumes, chickpeas. I love chickpeas. We had them for lunch yesterday. I had uh, kidney beans for lunch today. Kidney beans and chickpeas are over here, but you eat them with lots of veggies and salad. It brings a nice balance. So it's all a matter of balance. Now, the gardener, he can play with the pH of his soil to get different effects in different vegetables. Are you familiar with the hydrangea plant? The hydrangea plant is a big bush and it has big flowers and every flower has lots of little flowers in it. And sometimes you'll see a hydrangea plant and the flowers are pink. Sometimes they'll be a rich dark pink like magenta. Sometimes the flowers will be purple. Sometimes the flowers will be blue. Now they're not different types of hydrangea plants the gardener plays with the pH of the soil to get different coloured flowers. So just as the gardener plays with the pH of the soil to get different coloured flowers, you can play with the pH of your cell and get different health, sickness results happening in your body. As I showed you recently, drastically dropping, even wiping out the nightshades, going to a more alkaline diet, checking the air in your home, having sun every day, stopping all the acids, or, or this acid group anyway, going to bed earlier, exercising every day, being mindful of this equation, drinking adequate water. The best time to drink water is between meals because if you drink water with your meal, that's a good way to dilute your stomach acid. Remember, you don't want to dilute that. You want that nice and sparky so that you can break down your protein. We should stop drinking half an hour before a meal and resume drinking about an hour and a half after a meal. That is ideal. Now, if someone's thirsty after the meal, by all means, have a mouthful. That's not going to dilute too much. But if you sit to your meal well hydrated, you should not need to drink large, amount, large amounts with your meal. And that's another habit so common today, isn't it? To drink large 
amounts with the meal. So being mindful of the acid alkaline, you can play with the health status of your body. Are there any questions as we close? Yes. What's the effect of apple cider vinegar? I don't use apple cider vinegar. The, the lemon has a far more alkalizing effect. The only place I advise apple cider vinegar is on the toes if someone has tinea or athlete's foot. There are a lot of claims about apple cider vinegar, but all of those claims you can apply to the lemon. Uh, a habit that we have at Misty Mountain Health Retreat is to put lemon in the water first thing in the morning. Lemon is one of the best liver tonics there is. And the lemons are just coming on in the trees, aren't they? As we go into winter. And if you have lemon trees and you've got an abundance, you can squeeze them all, pour them into ice cube containers, freeze them and then throw them into a little snap lock bag and keep them in the freezer. Yes? Can you drink too much soy milk? You certainly can. People say to me, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned. <laughs> I, I eat food. I have teeth. And you see, when my children had teeth, um, they ate food. So my babies were on breast milk until they had teeth, and then slowly I didn't feed them anymore. So... You definitely can drink too much soy milk because we really shouldn't be drinking soy milk. What we should be drinking is water or herb teas or maybe for a tonic effect half an hour before a meal or for an evening meal you could have a, a vegetable juice. So I personally in my home don't use soy milk. I don't use any milk. Sometimes if I make my husband an apple strudel, you can eat well, you know. I'll put a lump of coconut cream on top of that. Or maybe I'll blend up cashews to a fine powder and then put a tin of pears in natural's juice in it and blend it again, make a beautiful cream out of that. So that's more how I would use it. Some say, well, what about mashed potato? When I mash potato, I try and cook the potatoes in a little bit of water so by the time they're cooked, there's no water left. And then I pour olive oil and Celtic salt and mash and mash and you get a beautiful mashed potato. Any other questions? Yeah? Beet sugar and cane sugar basically both come under this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, sugar cane is over here. But when you extract that pure acid out, it becomes over here. And the, the antacid medication, now just think for a moment, if someone takes antacid, what's going to happen to the acid in their stomach? It wipes it out. So, it, yeah, it interferes with digestion because it inhibits uh, protein digestion. And that person can suffer from um, protein deficiency because if you don't have the enzymes in your gut to break down the protein, it can't get into the blood. On the first note, I said your gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube and anything that goes into that hollow tube doesn't become part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances and absorbed into the blood. So if you haven't got the enzymes the acids to break down your food, it can't get into the blood. And so the person can suffer from malnutrition. It's taken usually because of reflux, um, the acid coming up. And so in that, you've just got to restore that valve. You see, by taking antacids, is like shooting all of the horses because they keep getting out of the gateway. Just shut the gate. And that, that's all you have to do here is you shut that gate. Now, another man told me he'd been, on, he'd been on Nexium or the equivalent for 25 years and he started taking cayenne pepper. Now, if you take cayenne pepper, it, it's the, the stimulating effect in your stomach wakens all your gastric glands and you produce 
nice amounts of gastric acid. And what he did, because he increased his gastric acid, his food was starting to be breaking down properly and he had no more reflux. Some people have reflux because they haven't got enough uh, acid in the stomach to break down the food and that food starts to ferment and sometimes that's the acid that's coming up. I have yet to meet a person with too much acid in their stomach. It's, it's almost a, uh, a fallacy, this, this high acid in the stomach. Yes? Yep. What's the best time to take cayenne pepper? The best time to take cayenne pepper is just before your meal or on your meal because that's when you'll stimulate digestion. Don't take it before you go to bed or you'll be... because <laughs> it'll wake everything up. Question? Okay, very good question. Uh, Baby's one and a half, and uh, how many teeth? One year and two months. He's only got his front teeth, so, and he's eating lots of food. I would stop all grain, wean him off all the grain. He can have vegetables, he can have sweet potato and broccoli, all the vegetables, but not grain yet. And the molars, until the four cusps are through on all the teeth, only then will the tylen come through. Yes? Yeah, what type of milk? Goat's milk's the best, and you can get carry care goat's milk formulas, which some mothers find that very, very helpful. It's very easy, too. Or you can, if you've got a juicer, carrot sorry, and apple juice at that age, it's fine. And the babies quite like it, because it's nice with that little bit of... Uh, 80% carrot, 10% apple, 10% celery can replace the milk. Mm -hmm. Now, I have had some women start to beat themselves up over this. One woman started crying, said, I've done everything wrong. I said, you must not beat yourself up because you were doing the best that you knew. And there's a lovely verse in the Bible. It's Acts 30, verse 17. It says, God winks at our ignorance. So should we. Got that? <laughs> but today's another day and you can start doing it right. There's a question up there. What's the effect of having citrus with your meal? If you have the citrus lemon with your meal, it uh, helps digestion. If you have orange with your meal, and I would have um, orange, say, with the fruit meal, it's perfectly fine. How about orange juice? You shouldn't have a lot of juice with the meal. And some people um, work all day, no time to drink, sit down to their meal and eat large mugs of juice with their meal. But that, that is not a good idea because there's a lot of sugar in juice. And you just um, juice an orange and it takes about three big oranges to make a whole glass of orange juice. I think juice should take the place of food. It should not be, it should not really be done with the meal. Now if I'm at a wedding uh, as I was recently and you toast the bride and you've got some lovely grape juice there, a couple of mouthfuls, to it's not a problem. You see it's not the odd day you do it and the odd day you don't do it. It's what you do every day, every meal that has the effect on the body. Yes? I don't use grape seed oil. It was probably about 80 years ago that they developed equipment to be able to extract oils from hard seeds and it takes chemicals and heat to get it out. So the two oils that you can extract very easily from the flesh of the plant are the olive oil and the coconut oil. So they're the only oils that I advise. Yes? Where does fish come into it? Um, fish is a meat on the acid side. Unfortunately today there is rarely a fish you can buy that is not tainted with chemicals or poisons. Um, fish is very high. The recent fisheries testing in Australia was they could not find one fish without mercury in it. 
I know about three years ago they banned all fishing from Sydney Harbour because the children of the fishermen had high levels of dioxin and mercury in them. So unfortunately, because of the state of our seas and our rivers today, fish really is not a safe food. Yes? Probiotic supplements. Probiotic supplements. Probiotic supplements are great. Do you remember that uh, villa I just <laughs> drew with its thick turf wall and how a lot of it had been broken down? Well, how you can replace that thick turf wall is take... Number one, a probiotic supplement. And probiotic means for life. And a probiotic supplement is best taken three quarters of an hour before breakfast, so it goes down there. And there are two herbs that can help to coat, line and seal uh, the lining of the gut. One is aloe vera. A bit slimy, and that's exactly what your gut is. And the other herb is slippery elm. And as the, la as the name implies, when you put water with it, it does go a little bit slippery and slimy, but excellent for healing the lining of the gut. Hippocrates said, let, said all disease begins in the gut. And when you consider what I've showed you this evening, all the things that break down that, that thick turf wall and then the different foods that can come in and further aggravate that, it's... Uh, it was quite prophetic for him to say that. Yes? What causes arthritis? What causes arthritis is usually an overload of acid. And, and I just look at my dear mother, <laughs> who did not realise it, but she ate mostly from this side. Now, there's a bit of genetics there. Remember, genetics loads the gun, but it is lifestyle that pulls the trigger. Yes? What sort of powder? Lotus powder. I'm not, I don't know lotus powder. Pardon? Okay. Um, I'm not familiar with the lotus powder. I'm sorry. Okay, well, I'd be interested to see what its actives and its effects are, the lotus powder. Thank you for your attention tonight. Remember, um, if you've got some bigger questions, we've got, we're have got we going to be devoting um, Sunday afternoon at 6 o'clock. Is it? No. 2 o'clock. I have to be at the airport at 6.30 from, is that right? 4.30. Sorry, I'll be on the plane at 6.30. But at, from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, we're going to be looking at questions so we can pursue that in a bit more detail. Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock here, I'm going to be showing you how to rewire your brain. I'm going to be showing you how your brain can get younger as you age. And... Um, Pastor William has kindly let me take the usual church service here, so there'll be, there'll be a couple of songs and a prayer and they'll be taking up an offering. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. And then we'll be going straight into how you can rewire your mind. And then tomorrow afternoon, uh, that's the 6 o'clock, isn't it? 6 till 8 o'clock, we'll be having practical demonstration on, on uh, natural remedies. So bring your pen and paper with you tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow morning to know how to rewire your brain. Please bow your heads as I close. Father in heaven, thank you so much again for this amazing body. Thank you for the knowledge on the acid alkaline, more conditions to give the body to get optimum performance out of it. I pray that each of us will be inspired, Father, to look a little differently at our body and to respect it and to look after it because it's the only one we've got. And the person who will benefit the most from giving it the right conditions, of course, is us. So may you help us, may you inspire us, and may you encourage us in this walk is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.